Good morning, everyone. Welcome. I beat the countdown today. Did you see that? I was up here before it hit zero. Don't get used to that. <clears throat> it's not going to happen. Well, welcome to Grace Community Chapel. I'm glad you're here this morning. Good to see all you. Um, if you're online, you have audio, but there's no video yet, I hear. So I think that's a blessing for you right now. Um, but nobody disagreed or anything. They're like, yeah, that's a good point. If you don't have to see Ben, that's, that's nice. Anyway, why don't we pray, and then I'll tell you what's going on today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day we have today. We thank you for all the people here, all the people at home worshiping and joining us, and we um, just thank you for all of the people that make up the body here. Um, we pray for your blessing on the service and for the meeting after. Uh, we love you, and we thank you for all that you do for us, and pray this in your name. Amen. So, a few announcements. Sorry, I got something in my eye. I'm not crying. They're not sad announcements. Um, right after church today, our annual business meeting. So if you are a member here, you can vote during the business meeting. If you're not a member, but you want to just stay and hang out and, and watch, that's fine too. Um, I don't know if it's that entertaining, but it might bring you some joy. So right after church, business meeting, the posting, the details of it are at both entrances. You can see them um, for financial and pastoral package information. Uh, you can pick up the pack packets afterward, or it'll be on the screen. You can just look at it there. But if you're somebody that likes to hold paper and see it in your hands and, you know, contribute to the destruction of trees, you can do that too. <laughs> um, you can get that. So that's right after church. Um, we brought lunch for us, not for anybody else, so I'm sorry. But, you know. <laughs> Second announcement, ladies' Bible study will be starting up on January 30th uh, from 2 to 4 p.m. That's on Sunday. Um, ladies age 10 and up. So if you are in that group, I'm talking to you. Okay? Opposite of that, men's breakfast is this Saturday, 8 p.m. 8 a.m., not p.m. That would be breakfast for dinner. That'd be fun, but it's not happening. Um, 8 a.m. breakfast. If you want to help me cook, you can show up around 7.30, um, and food might taste better if you help. I'm not sure. It's pretty good most of the time, I think. It is. It is, yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, 8 o'clock this Saturday at the church, men's breakfast. Um, also, the school is passively, well, not passively, they're going to be starting to look for teachers for next year if you're um, interested in that type of thing, if you like kids. And I'm told it's like fifth and sixth grade area, so if you're smarter than a fifth grader, I think you can apply. <laughs> yeah, me too. I can't win the game. We have the game, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? And I can't win it, so I don't know if that's good or bad. Exactly. Anyway, uh, see Bruce or a school board member if you're interested in that. I think that's all I have. There's a bunch of announcements up on the screen in the beginning. If you were looking, they're not there anymore. But before the service starts, there's a rolling thing of announcements going on, like uh, church work days, uh, where the nursery is. Um, by the way, that's going on. If you, if you have a kid that wants to go to nursery, it's down there. Um, that's right now. And just all of that stuff is up there. So check out the board when you come in to get all the details of what's going on here. Can I what? Put it. Oh, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. I'll talk to Jeremy about it. He might do it. <laughs> All right. So next thing we have is scripture reading. If you have a Bible, um, you can turn to Matthew chapter 26. If you don't have a Bible, there's probably one around you on a seat. It's not the same translation as what I'm going to read out of, but that's okay. I'm in the ESV. Matthew 26 starting in verse 26. All right. Let me just make sure I'm in the right chapter. Okay, good. <laughs> now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my, my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for you, for, out, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And may the Lord bless the reading of his word, and we'll continue to worship him with our songs.
Good morning and welcome. I hear rumor it's going to get up to like 20 degrees this week. <laughs> Heat wave. <laughs> Won't you join us as we be begin our worship portion of the service? The light has come, the light has, has won, won, behold the Christ, hope has a name, his name is Jesus, my Savior's Christ, has set the sinner free, hope has a name, his name is Jesus, oh Christ be free, I have song I'd like to lead us in prayer. Glorious Father in heaven, thank you for leading us to that song of hope we just played. We pray that that song and the others continue to honor and glorify you. Your holy word reminds us that you gave us victory over death and sin through your son Jesus. Blessed be your glorious name and may it be exalted above blessing and praise. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
next song was written by uh, a group called The Afters, and it kind of makes a good point. Um, the way, not all scripture is easy to take and put into a song. Sometimes it doesn't rhyme, but this, this first line of the chorus just sings so well. Well done, well done, my good and faithful one. <laughs> whole life to hear you say 
Well done, well done, my good and faithful one. Welcome to the place where you belong. Well done, well done, my beloved child. You have run the race and now you're home. Welcome to the place. Good morning. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. Let's just skip to that day, right? <laughs> now we got things to do here. 
All right. Well, let's pray. Uh, God, thank you. Thank you that we, when we don't feel like we belong anywhere, that that's because we recognize that this is not our home. God, I pray that this morning your word would go out, that it would be your words and not mine, be your truth and not mine. God, I pray that uh, those who gathered here would feel a sense of belonging as they are among brothers and sisters in Christ, a glimpse of the kingdom that's yet to come. Pray that your spirit would move and work in the people here today. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. All right, I'm going to take the mask off so that it doesn't uh, interfere with hearing me. Or sometimes people need to read lips. I get that. I get that need. All right, so... Does anyone know what we've been talking about for like the last like two months? Church, okay. <laughs> you got that. We're good. <laughs> I could go home. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, so we're con- talking about the church, and we're going to continue talking about the church today. Um, and uh, we're going to be talking more about the ordinances of church today. Uh, and if you don't know what that word is, good. I'm glad you're here. Uh, you're going to learn what that word is, and you're going to know what that means by the end of today. So what have we talked so, about so far? So first off, church. We talked about how the church is not a building. It's, it's you know, we, we might say, hey, we go to church or, or something like that, and, and, and that's kind of a misnomer. It's, it's misnamed uh, that the church is the called community of believers. When we meet together, wherever that's at and whatever the conditions are in, that's the church. And we talked about how there's a local in a universal outpouring of that. Then we talked about how there's the purpose, the reason why we gather. Why do we, why do we get together? Why do we do this thing called assemble or church? Why do we do that? And, and we, we talked about a couple reasons. Uh, one is to worship corporately like we've already done this morning. Uh, the worship team has done an excellent job in preparing our hearts for the truth of Scripture. And ultimately, that's the second part of preaching the word and, and declaring the truth. We've also talked about how the purpose of the church is to stir one another up to love and good works and how we're to be working with one another and helping each other do good works in the community. We've talked about how we are to pursue holiness in the community and how part of what the church's responsibility is for each other is to stir one another up to holiness. We've also talked about how the purpose is meeting the needs of the household of faith and that if you're coming here today and you're in need, that it's our job to help support that need collectively as the church. So then we talked about the last two weeks. We got on mission. And I only did two weeks on mission because, not because it's less important, but because it's really clear. And we talked about how there's an overarching mission of the church, which is the faithful worship of the one triune God and to glorify him and enjoy him forever. It's taken from the Westminster Confession of Faith. But... Really and truly, we are individually called to the commission of going and making disciples, teaching them to observe all that Jesus has commanded. That was week one. And last week, we talked about being salt and light and what it means to be salt and light in the community of believers and then outside of that community. So now we're talking about what else about the church? What else does the church do? So we're going to talk about two ordinances because Grace Community Chapel, kind of mirroring itself after the Baptist faith and message, has two ordinances that we believe that the church is to do. The first one, which we're going to be talking about this morning, is the Lord's Supper. And I thought about doing the Lord's Supper since we were going to talk about the Lord's Supper, uh, but there's two reasons why I didn't. Uh, One, because there's a business meeting afterwards, and I already know it's going to be a long day for the kids. And I was like, "Uh, don't add, don't add. (laughs) Uh, but, but the other reason is because I wasn't, there was no opportunity to prepare you for that. Uh, and so I, I wanted to make sure you had the opportunity to prepare. Um, so that's the first ordinance. The second ordinance is baptism. That's the other ordinance that we as a church participate in. So uh, how many of you have ever heard the word sacrament? Okay, raise your hand. Okay, fair, fair amount of you. So, so there's, there's two words that are commonly used, and, and we're going to address them both. One is ordinance, and the other is sacrament. Uh, so ordinance. Ordinance defined is a Christian rite, such as baptism or the Eucharist, that is believed to have been ordained by Christ and is held as a means of divine grace or a sign 
or symbol of a spiritual reality. That's what an ordinance is. It's primarily a sign of a spiritual reality that's done because Christ commanded us to do this ritualistic practice. Okay? A sacrament, however, if we were to take an alternative kind of word that describes the same thing, is an outward sign of an inward grace that has been instituted by Christ Jesus. Sacraments signify God's grace in a way that is outwardly observed to the participant. That's Augustine of Hippo. 400s, if you like, if you like your, your history. The idea behind a sacrament, as opposed to an ordinance, it's not so much a symbol as it is an actual means of grace. Right? That it, grace is actually being applied. And so when there's the discussion between which is it, an ordinance or a sacrament, the faith tradition that you belong to will tell you whether it's an ordinance or a sacrament based on what they think the action of the ritual does in your life. If you believe it's an ordinance, you believe it's primarily a symbol, a memorial. If you believe it's a sacrament, you believe it's a legitimate means of God imparting divine grace on your behalf. So, for some Protestants, uh, in order to make a more divisive break from the Catholic tradition, they drop the word sacrament entirely, um, as it had too many associations with Catholic teachings. So, to help you understand, I brought my Catholic catechism with me today. Not many of you may have this, and I don't necessarily mean that you should go out and get one, uh, but it's valuable to know what they teach, right? And so I'm going to give you uh, specifically what they teach uh, on page 140 of their short, this is the short catechism. The big one's huge, I couldn't bring it with me. Um, So what is a sacrament? The sacrament is an effectious sign of grace instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church, which by divine life is being dispensed to us. That's what the Catholic Church teaches, they teach that by these, these sacraments, and the Catholic Church actually has seven, um, and those seven range anywhere from marriage, which is actually a sacrament in the Catholic tradition, uh, to even the holy orders of um, you know, Hail Marys and those sort of things that take part of confession. Right? So any one of those things they deem as a means of God imparting grace in your life. And our tradition says no, that's... That's not it. God gave us two, and he gave us ordinances. So by ordinances, we mean that those things are symbols of something that's an internal reality. It's a symbol of internal reality. So we don't believe that God is actually providing any means of grace. When you, when you take the communion cups and you take the bread, or when you participate in baptism, you're not actually getting any grace through that. No no saving grace through that. You're, you're just participating in a ritual that talks about an inward reality. So, at GCC, we teach that that's a sign or a symbol of a spiritual reality. I'm going to um, read at some point, we'll, we'll talk about the actual statement. Um, but the church holds the two ordinances, baptism, which we'll talk about next week. That comes from Matthew 28, 19 and other places. Go, therefore make disciples, baptizing them. That's part of what Jesus commanded. Whereas communion, you might find, we read this morning in Matthew, we read again in Luke, it says, and he took bread and he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That's, hey, keep doing this. Uh, GCC's statement is that the Lord's Supper is for believers who upon self-examination remember the Lord's death and anticipate his coming. That's what we believe, that's in our constitution, what the communion is about. So, there are a lot of issues that come up with communion. Um, And uh, so, I I figured we might want to address a couple of those issues. Things that are said, things that are commented on, different words you may have heard over the years, and you're like, what does that mean? Uh, So, let's talk about some of the issues before we get into the, what exactly is communion, why do we do it? Okay? So I was recently listening to an interview, and I don't necessarily recommend it. It was by Babylon B, and they were interviewing Elon Musk. Uh, Does anyone know who Elon Musk is? Okay, some of you do. Younger generation, come on, you guys know who Elon Musk is. Yeah, come on. (laughs) He's on Twitter all the time. I mean, come on. (laughs) So so they were interviewing him, and and, um, he made some of the very similar statements that many agnostics and atheists will make, right? Uh, they, they They make some statements that... You know, communion's kind of weird, 
right? I mean, you're talking about body and blood, and then we're eating this body, and then we're drinking this blood. Like, are we cannibals? I want to just give you some statements that, um, that Elon Musk gave in this interview. He said, um, he said, when I was a kid, he says, we we're going to give you this weird tasting biscuit and wine. And he said, I always thought it was kind of weird. It's a metaphor for cannibalism. I remember thinking, huh, it's just crazy. He said, even as a metaphor, it's kind of odd. As a child, I remember thinking, is this actually body and blood? Because I don't, I don't want to be a cannibal. I don't want to eat somebody. Those were his statements in reference to communion. I, I think if you've not been raised in church, it's kind of a weird thing, right? It's like, what, what the heck is this, right? And it was a shame in that interview, uh, as was at the end of that interview, a lot was that shame, uh, that they didn't address his questions. Because there, there are answers to those questions. And unfortunately, they didn't. They had an opportunity to, to share with him what communion's about, and they, and they didn't. Um, but oftentimes, I think about as we're interacting with people in the community, they might ask questions about stuff like this. And do you, do you have an answer? Do you have an answer for why we do communion? Or do you just kind of say, yeah, it is kind of weird. <laughs> don't know. I don't know why we do it, right? I think sometimes that's kind of where we're at. Like, well, we've just always done it that way. It's been 2,000 years. We're not going to break the tradition now, right? So that's one issue. Why do we do it? It's kind of weird. Symbolism's really weird. Why do we do it? So we'll get to that in a minute. But here are some other issues. So did you know that the very first controversy in the church, the very first big controversy that split the church, now I'm talking about there was only one church, and then all of a sudden there were two churches in the same city, and that had never occurred before. It's called the Donatist Controversy. You can look it up on Google later if you want. Uh, but basically the idea was ex apo operato or ex apo operanti. That's Latin. But what it means is it's by the elements or by the agent. And what was happening in the third century is Rome just declared that Christianity was no longer anti-Rome. They kind of said, okay, you can be Christian and it's okay, right? We're no longer going to kill you for being Christian. And there was this transition point where some priests had done things like when they were come against by, and I say priests, pastors, elders, they, they were come to against the Romans and the Romans would be like, hey, you need to offer a pinch of incense to Caesar and say Caesar is Lord or you're going to die. And those pastors and those elders and those bishops, they would do that. They would offer the pinch of incense. Or the Romans would say, you need to give us the scriptures. And they would do it. Because they didn't want to die. And after Rome passed the edict of declaring Christianity okay, those bishops were continuing to practice as bishops. And the statement was, is if you gave up the scriptures, if you gave up Christ and you said Caesar is Lord then you can't perform the sacraments. You can't perform baptism. You can't perform the Lord's Supper because it doesn't mean anything to you anymore. And the church split over that issue. Nowadays, we recognize that if I'm unqualified coming up here and I give you the elements, it's a matter of what you are in response to the elements, not a matter of the one giving the elements. So, ex apo operato. That's, that's the Latin. It's in the elements themselves, between you and the elements, not the person giving them. Okay? The next one that came up was pretty big during the Reformation. It's transubstantiation. Who's heard of the word transubstantiation before? Okay, some more people, especially if you're in, raised from the Catholic tradition. Uh, so I, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what transubstantiation is. Uh, transubstantiation actually is... Uh, the idea that when the priest performs the prayer over the bread and the, and the wine, that God works a miracle, and that bread, although still looks like bread, feels like bread, smells like bread, tastes like bread, it's now actually Jesus' body. The substance has changed. It was bread, now it's Jesus' flesh. It was wine, but now it's Jesus' blood. And there's a transition that occurs. What actually happened during the Middle Ages is that it got to the point where they were so scared after they performed this sacrifice or ritual kind of thing of turning the, the body 
bread into body and wine into blood, that they wouldn't give the blood out. And the reason why they wouldn't give the blood out is because you carried it in a cup and you kind of carried it along to people and they would take a sip out of it. And they were worried about spilling Jesus' blood all over the ground and what that might mean. And, And if you really truly do believe that there's a change that occurs and it now becomes Jesus' blood, you, they, they, they were worried about that. So they said, you know what, let's just withhold the wine. So if you were a commoner up until the mid-1500s, you would not receive the blood ever. You would only receive the body. And you would receive it as the priest gives it to you. Well, Luther, among other things, that was one of his big issues, was that it was to be given to everyone. Not only should everyone have the scriptures, they should be able to participate in all of communion. Luther believed in consubstantiation, the fact that Christ was present with the bread. So he took it a little bit back and said, yeah, there's a change that occurs, but Christ is with the bread, and you know, that's, that's the difference. And then yet further, as we go into the Reformation, there was Zwingli that came around and said, hey, you know what? It's really just a symbol. There's actually nothing that changes in the bread. It's just a symbol. Because Jesus is in heaven, that's where his body is. It's not coming down back to earth until later, right? And so the Baptist tradition picks up, Grace Community Chapel picks up that it is a symbol. It's a tradition. It's something that that we're doing, but there's no change that occurs in that little weird cracker at the top of the peel-off, right? (laughs) There's no change in in the grape juice that we use uh, in, in the cup. So... We view it as a memorial. It's a remembrance. So those are some of the issues that you may have heard about, you may not have heard about, about communion. So what is it? What is it? Uh, so one of, the, one of the words that was commonly used for Lord's Supper or communion in the, probably the first six centuries was Eucharist. And, and we don't like to use that word anymore because it, one, Baptists are really against kind of any sort of like weird liturgical tradition thing. We're just immediately against that. And, and this is not a Baptist church, but it follows Baptist distinctives, right? So, so you know, we're, we're against the Eucharist word. But Eucharist is actually a great word. It's a Greek word for thanksgiving. That's all it means. It means thanksgiving. And, and part of the reason why they use that word to describe the Lord's Supper is it is a time to give thanks for what God has done. So in, in some ways, Eucharist is actually a better word than Lord's Supper because what is that anyways? <laughs> Let's turn to Matthew chapter 26. You guys are probably, we read this earlier, but that's where we're going to start, Matthew chapter 26. And there are two other parallels that we could turn to, but we're going to stick in the Matthew passage. Matthew 26, and starting in verse 26, that's where we get this institution. I'm going to read to verse 30 for you. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink of it, all of you. For this is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the, trans- for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it with you, drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. All three gospel accounts, the one in Matthew, the one in Luke, and the one in Mark, they're all fairly similar in essence. And if we were to turn to 1 Corinthians, Paul states that he was handed down the same tradition. So the tradition that started at this point was perpetuated throughout the church and throughout Acts. And Paul said he received it directly from the Lord himself. So this is something that is intended to be continually practiced until the Lord comes. So, tradition is there because God commanded it. But why do we celebrate this tradition? Why do, why do we do it? Why did God command us to do this? Why did Jesus say, do this in remembrance of me? Is it just kind of, all right, we'll do it. Whew, got that done with. Now they're doing it once a month? Jeez. <laughs> okay, we'll do it once a month. Right? Well, well, why? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we're going to be here the rest of the morning. 
Uh, Corinthians is after Romans, which is probably one of the longest books, letters in the New Testament. We're going to be looking at um, chapter 11, and we're going to start uh, probably down in verse 23. And I just want you to see exactly what Paul says here. 11, verse 23 says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. So we see here, Paul's saying, that which I received from the Lord I've given to you. Right? That this is something that you're supposed to do. Okay? Back up to verse 17. We're going to read 17 to the end of the chapter. A lot of words. We're going to go over as much of it as we can. 1 Corinthians 17. Oh, 1 Corinthians 11, 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that who, those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not for the Lord's supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another one gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Let's pause there. What's interesting about 1 Corinthians is if you read through the whole book, you start seeing that Paul is coming alongside, and there's some divisions going on in the church. And it starts right off the beginning that Paul talks about it, like, you know, I follow Peter, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Christ, right? And everyone's kind of talking about who they follow. And Paul's kind of going through and he says, hey, you know what? I'm going to commend you in this, but this is where you're off. And he goes down through all of Corinthians and says, yes, basically, yes, but. And they'll talk about, well, you know, women's hair should be long. We see that just in the portion before. They should have head coverings. And Paul says, okay, I see your point here, but I don't have any practices neither do any of the churches of God. That's how he ends that section. Right? So he, he affirms some of the things that they say and go, okay, yeah, that's fair and true, but, but this is the truth. And he gets to the Lord's Supper after doing this with many different things. And he says, for the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. Paul says, there's no place here where I can look at you and go, well done. In everything. I look at you, there's nothing to commend. There's nothing, there's nothing good. In fact, it'd be better off if you didn't even meet at all. Because your meeting promotes d- diversity against those who don't have much, harms others. What was probably happening in that day, you've got to remember, you've got different classes of people that are being saved. You've got people who are probably the, of the Restillian class. They've got a lot of money. They've got a nice business. They might come halfway through the day, show up at church, and they might bring you know, the really nice food, and they start eating, and maybe they've got a nice alcoholic beverage, <clears throat> and they start getting a little tipsy, filled with the wrong kind of spirit. And then you've got the slaves who are working all day for their masters, They're finally able to kind of break away, and they can't bring much with them because if they brought anything, it'd be considered stealing. And they've got very little. And they're coming into this assembly, and you've got people who are probably falling over drunk, which is wrong, discussed elsewhere in Scripture. And then you've got these people who are coming in with nothing. And Paul says, this is way out of balance. Not the purpose. I have nothing to commend you, he says. What shall I say? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Jesus is always interested in those who have not much and have little. That's something we must recognize. It's all through the Old Testament, too. But, so what, what is the Lord's Supper? So we, we use the bread, and, and I'm going to read this next section, 23 through 26, and, and I want you to think about maybe what is being said here. Verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So, I have, I think, five things. Yes, five things that the Lord's Supper does for the believers. Why we're supposed to do it. Number one, the Lord's Supper is the center and symbol of Christian unity. I'll say that again. The Lord's Supper is the center and the symbol of Christian unity, which is why Paul was so upset about the disunity that was occurring before the Lord's Supper. Now, if you turn back just a little bit at chapter 10, verse 20, uh, verse 17, chapter 10, verse 17, there's other instructions on the Lord's Supper in chapter 10. We're not going to do all of it today. Uh, but verse 17 says this, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for all we all partake of the one bread. Now, when they did communion, <laughs> frankly, up until the American tradition, they didn't have a plate that had little crackers on it. Many of you might be familiar with that. And then another little thing that you can buy that you put all the little cups in. Like, they didn't have that. <laughs> that wasn't how the tradition started. It was a one big piece of bread, and they would break off pieces of that bread and give it to people individually. The reason for that is the symbolism that occurs within that image. And unfortunately, by getting little crackers, we've, we've kind of distorted the symbolism for ourselves. Because part of the point is that you take that one piece of bread, which is Jesus' body, which is broken for you, and you give it to members of Christ's church, who are then one body because they've all taken on Christ's death. Do you, do you see that? It's more symbolism. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, obviously, due to COVID, we're, we're, I'm not suggesting that we all jump on and get one piece of bread and start ripping it off. There, there's, there's some reasons why we don't do it that way, but the symbolism is important for you to understand. That's why Paul gets so angry in 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 22, it's because they broke the symbol. They ruined the image. And that their division, instead of showing the unity that the Lord's Shepherd was supposed to display, is actually creating division. So number two. Number two. One clear command from this is my body, do this in remembrance, is the do this in remembrance. That's the command. Now there's been no more debate over the centuries, and we talked about a little bit of this is my body. So I'm not going to get into that anymore this morning. But the do in remembrance part is key. The command is that we do it in remembrance. So uh, what I think is sad is that Jesus, when talking to the disciples before his crucifixion, he says, do this in remembrance. Of all people, I should not forget what Christ has done for me. Of all people, Christians should not forget what Christ has done for us. But Jesus knows our weakness and our frailty, and he knows that we will forget. Because the reality is, is all of a sudden we begin to focus on other things. Like we, we focus on the AV equipment. Like I had to do this this morning. I apologize to you online. There was a lot of weird stuff this morning. Or we focus on meetings or, uh, you know, worship team or the announcements or the building maintenance or, or we just focus on something in our own life. And we forget the reason why we actually come together. We are called to remember Christ's sacrifice of his death. And if we are not careful, we can fall into the same pit that the Jewish people fell in. If you remember, in Amos chapter 5, verse 21 through 23, God specifically condemns the Jews and says, I'm sick of your feasts. I'm sick of every little religious rite that you participate in because it's, it's not honoring to me. I think if we're not careful, 
and we don't do communion in remembrance, we can fall into that same pit where we're just doing it. Third, why do we do communion? Number three, it's a time of proclamation. It's the Lord's death. It's the gospel. It's the good news. So there's some really cool symbolism. We discussed the bread already, right? Like there's that one piece of bread that's broken for the whole body. Jesus, through his sacrifice, brought many together to life. But also in the first century, there was another obvious symbol that I think we forget today. Uh, and that's this, that something must die in order for you to be sustained in life. Uh, so if I was to run out after here and go grab a burger because I got hungry and run over Burger King over there, um, when they gave me that burger, that cow had to die, the lettuce had to die, the onions had to die, the wheat was crushed up, killed, made into bread. All of those things had to die in order that I might eat it and sustain life. Jesus, when he is in Matthew 26, talking about my body is the bread, what he's saying by that is not that there's some sort of mystical transubstantiation. He's saying that when something dies to give you life, which they were very familiar with, us, we go to the store. We're not quite so familiar with it, right? You don't see that process. He's saying when that thing dies and you eat it and it sustains your life, that is what this is. There's also Passover symbolism, which I don't have time to go over this morning. Uh, Jews for Jesus, great website that deals with a lot of that symbolism. But the intention of the time of remembrance is celebration, not only to remind ourselves the gospel, but it's also proclaiming in a visible way to those around us. We want to make sure those symbols are well understood so that when someone enters our midst and they see that visible res representation of the gospel, that we're saying, hey, this is what we believe. That we, we take this bread not because it's what we've done for 2,000 years, but we take this bread recognizing that just like when something is sacrificed to bring us life, Christ was sacrificed to bring us life. And that his blood, which was shed, is a sign of a new covenant that is yet to come, that is fulfilling and being fulfilled in the church. But also at the same time, that proclamation of the gospel should not be absent from those who believe and who know the gospel. It must be also used to proclaim the gospel to ourselves. The reason why partially we started doing it more frequently is because we want that to be a constant focus, is the gospel. That it would constantly be brought back to your remembrance. The reason why we meet is the gospel. There's no other reason to meet. If Christ is not dead and then ultimately raised, we have no hope. There's no reason to be here. Number four, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. I want to take a look at that verse specifically. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until when? Until he comes. So it's a temporary, anticipatory ordinance. We are going to continue to perform that ordinance until he comes. And once he comes, we don't need to practice that ordinance anymore because he's there. And we'll feast with him. We take the elements not only in saying that I remember, but also in saying, I know you're coming. Jesus himself said, we read in Matthew, that he would not partake until the day that he drinks it with us in his father's kingdom. There's an anticipation of that day. Number five, last reason why we do communion. It provides regular opportunity for moral and spiritual self-examination. Provides regular opportunity for moral and spiritual self-examination. 
Let's continue in verse 27 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, I want to say something to you this morning. Um, None of you are worthy, myself included, of Jesus' body and blood. So if, if you're thinking, well, I'm not worthy, yes, but that's not what Paul's talking about. Because apart from Christ's work, none of us are worthy. You don't become worthy to take the gospel. Okay? And same thing for communion. So if, if, you're, if you're ever thinking about approaching the table and going, you know what, I can't do that because I'm not worthy. Okay, good, you're in the right place. <laughs> come, come take. But... Continuing verse 28, let a person examine himself then so to eat the bread and drink the cup. For if anyone eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So, there is an element to which Worthiness does not come from you. However, we are to discern whether or not there is unrepentant sin in our life. Here, here's the thing. How much, if, if, if the Lord's communion is about the gospel, and it's about you coming in and thanksgiving for what God has done in your life, and, and, and recognizing and saying, yes, I am part of this body. I am taking the, the body of Christ because I'm part of it. But You've just gone on the whole last month, whatever, doing whatever in sin, and you're unrepentant. You don't care. In a sense, you're taking on the Lord's body. You're like, yeah, 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 I remember. Yeah, that's why I can do all the stuff I do. It's because of grace, right? The right way to come is broken over our sin and in repentance. If you are just kind of gallivanting, you know, whatever I want to do, I can do, right? God has mercy. That's, that's not the way that we approach that. That's the reason for the self-examination. God, am I really broken over my sin? Are you disciplining me over my sin? Hebrews talks about the fact that he disciplines those whom he loves. So if you're sinning and you're continuing to sin and you're not experiencing any discipline or repentance, that's a sign It's a sign that you're actually not part of that body. Woe to us if we approach the image of the gospel itself without repentance and expect that it's for us. How silly it is to live like we belong to the world and somehow approach communion, which is a declaration of our allegiance with him, and take it that way. The covenant nature of the cup is to remind God's people of his covenant through the body and the blood of Christ. And it is a perfect opportunity for us to renew our covenant to him in repentance and faith. You must either, I must either, abandon our sin and cling to the cross or stay in our sin and face judgment. That's what Paul's saying. Because if you're going to come to communion and you're going to stay in your sin, then you're, then you're just drinking judgment upon yourself because you're not really part. Now, it's possible that in that day, people were actually getting sick and dying. Uh, let me tell you this. Uh, if you lied to me, you're not going to die. But Ananias and Sapphira did in Acts. Because when God sets things up in his kingdom, when he first sets things up, he takes the punishment and judgment very seriously so we understand. And the first time that that lie occurred in the church community, it was taken harshly. And I think likewise with communion, when communion was taken inappropriately in the early church, 
it was handled with quick judgment. Judgment may be delayed now, but that doesn't mean it isn't coming. So, I'm going to repeat the reasons why we do communion. Reason number one is the Lord's Supper is the center and symbol of Christian unity. Reason number two, it is a clear command, do this in remembrance of me. Number three, it is a time of proclamation of the Lord's death, the gospel. Number four, it's a temporary anticipatory ordinance to proclaim his death until he comes. And number five, it provides us the regular opportunity for moral and spiritual self-examination. So, in coming back to the statement that GCC has, the Lord's Supper is for believers who upon self-examination remember the Lord's death and anticipate His second coming. I, I hope that us going over this in the detail that we have, if, if you've never heard it before, it might give you at least a little insight to why do we do that? And when we do it again next month, I'm going to give you a reminder of some of these things. So we can be thinking through as we participate in the Lord's Supper, why do we do that? Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you have ordained even religious actions and rites that we perform ultimately, God, for our good, knowing that we forget and how quick we, we forget. God, I pray that um, communion services at Grace would not be something where we just approach and we just do the feast like the, the Israelites did but don't honor you in doing those. God, I pray that uh, as we do move forward and we, we continue to take communion here at Grace, that this would be a constant reminder about why we do it. And Father, I pray that that would be true in my heart and my life. And God, I pray it be true amongst our assembly. We ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. We have one more song that we'd like to share with you. Please stand up. This line is refers to Psalm 4610. Oh be still and behold him. Cross the path.
for your divine grace and for this community of believers. It's such a privilege to be here this morning to share the truths of your holy word. Lord, we ask for your guidance this week and to help us remember the, the reasons for communion that Pastor Jeremy talked about. We ask these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. And stick around in about five or ten minutes for the business meeting. Amen.